Okay, so firstly, I'm sorry about the title. Uh, a lot of pressure put on me to come up with the title before I prepared my talk, so I just threw some words back. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm basically going to be talking about the issue of replication in life science fields from biomedical to evolutionary biology and everything in between. Uh, <clears throat> so three blind mice. Uh, no, those aren't scientists, those are actually mice. Uh, that's what a big topic for me. But I'm just gonna go through a scenario that I get in my Facebook feed and my email all the time. I read about a discovery of a brand new gene or pathway or drug for blindness, for cancer, whatever. And it might have been found first in fruit flies, which would tempt my interest since I'm a fruit fly person. Um, and then lo and behold, the same gene is found in mammals, let's say lab mice or a dog breed, um, and maybe even in humans. And the story often starts to unravel around the time a big pharma company, we'll call it X, buys the rights to that discovery of that gene, uh, pathway associated with the gene or a drug that targets that pathway. And having bought the rights to that discovery, they take it into their lab and they attempt to replicate that result with their lab organisms, be they fruit flies, mice, or dogs, and they discover it doesn't work. And this happens over and over and over again. And it's been going on for more than 30 years. Uh, why? I think that's a big theme today. It could be fraud, and there are known cases of fraud in biological research, especially cell biology. Uh, lack of diligent reporting or annotating. I've been to a meeting on replication issues where that was the focus. Basic experimental design flaws. Uh, really small stuff like not having controls and things like that. Or fourthly, perhaps something more profound in biology itself. So for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to be dealing with issues in biology and biomedical research. So I have no comments to make about social psychology. Uh, <clears throat> perhaps others do. Now, I was particularly interested to speak today because I was at an earlier meeting. Um, I think it was December. Uh, I won't uh, be too specific about the meeting. It was somewhat closed. And some of the information there was basically privileged. So I'm going to tell you this story protecting the identities of all concerned. So I go to this meeting in the, the basic pharma community. It was put on by a big pharma involving those of us who do baby pharma work and sometimes even fetal pharma work. Um, and one of their lead scientists told me the story about, uh, and she had a s s special focus on, let's say, disease Y. And her big pharma had picked up from both academics and baby pharma 20 leads that they paid good money for, 20 pieces of intellectual property, which were genes, drugs, or pathways, that they wanted to work on to develop drugs for a very large, important chronic disease sector. But after they'd paid the money, brought the technology into their facility, in uh, 20 out of 20 cases, or zero out of 20, to put it properly, it never worked. None of those 20 technologies ever worked. They had a zero out of 20 record of success, even in their own labs doing lab organism things. Zero out of 20 successes. Now that's a mind-blowing number. I really don't feel that fraud or even basic mistakes of experimental design could account for such a consistent record of failure. Okay? And I have a hypothesis to offer to you today, which, to be honest with you, I've bet my whole career on since 1980. Um, and that is that there is a deep problem in biology itself. This is not trivial. Biologists want to be good, but they have a key problem in breeding. Uh, put another way, as the mortal words of Jessica Rabbit, they're not bad, they're just drawn that way. And I think what draws them onto the rocks is inbreeding. Now, inbreeding, which I'm going to explain for those of you who aren't biologists, is a classic technique of biology. It was first, um, I think, used as a predicate for experimentation by Gregor Mendel in the 1860s. Genetics predominantly 
in the 20th century was based on inbred organisms, sometimes with added mutations or transgenic technologies. And I will argue today that inbreeding is the problem that has led biology astray. Now, for those of you who aren't biologists, what is inbreeding? Inbreeding is when you take a diverse polymorphic species, humans are an example of such, but so are you know, flowering plants, and then from them, either by accident or deliberate inbreeding, you create a genetically uniform derivative strain or stock, which has no more genetic variation. Now, generically, this always involves greatly reducing population size, the breeding pool you breed from. And whenever you do that, both theory and now experiments show us, you get an incredibly chaotic process of rapid genetic change where you end up in a particular place that you cannot anticipate in advance. So even though having done the inbreeding, you've created a very predictable organism at the end of your inbreeding process, what you get at the end is itself unpredictable. Now, you may choose, say, the flower or the dog for properties that you like, that you can see or easily measure, but associated with them will be all kinds of other problems, which is the point of my next slide. So here you have American beagles, overbred, which means highly inbred, um, very consistent to look at. They've got their standard coloration, size, patterns of behavior. With, and, and American beagles are, I would say tragically, a common biomedical research organism. But these puppies are messed up, literally. Here's a blind American beagle. Um, other breeds get deafness, other breeds get hip problems. There are some really appalling things that happen with dog breeds, not because of experimentation done with them, but because they are inbred. Being inbred makes them really good for well-defined genetic experiments, but being inbred means you get all kinds of unpredictable problems with them. Whoops, got ahead of myself, literally. So this core pathway is still at the foundation of both biological research and biomedical research, and even, to my great displeasure, evolutionary biology in many cases. Characteristically, we start with the easiest inbred organisms, here I'm just giving you an example of fruit flies, to develop some basic insights into all kinds of things from development, heart disease, neurological function, aging, which is what I work on, and so on. Then we use inbred mice, if we want to get closer to humans, if we're doing biomedical research, we use them as disease models for medical syndromes. And they will have those medical syndromes, but the problem is they often will have other things. And then if we're going farther, we use things like beagles, a larger, more complicated organism, or in vitro human cells prior to deploying that prospective treatment or that understanding or that diagnostic tool in a clinical setting with humans. And here's the core problem. If humans were in fact inbred organisms, like most lab flies, like most lab mice, like beagles, collies, you name the dog breed, then from working with all this inbred material, we would discover the problems in our very inbred human populations. But leaving aside Pitcairn Island and European royalty, we are not generally inbred. Okay, I mean, yes, there's Prince Charles, but most of us are mongrels. Most of us outbreed all the time. We love to do it, whatever our parents think of it. So in my opinion, the inbred organism dominated pathway for biomedical research systematically leads to failure because of the unpredictability and confounds associated with inbred organisms. Whenever you seek to apply them to human populations, or for that matter, use them as models for what happens in the wild, which is what most species of plants and animals are, outbred. So what I've been doing since about 1980 is how to develop a research paradigm that works with outbred organisms all the way through. Now, I work with fruit flies, as I outed myself earlier, and a lot of things we do look like what goes on in other labs that work with fruit flies, but we use outbred flies. So the question then becomes, if you're an experimentalist, how do you get your signal? How do you get differences between these populations of outbred flies? And the answer is we use experimental evolution. And then we do 
all kinds of things like other labs do. So very quickly, introduction to experimental evolution, which I've been doing for 40 years. Um, my favorite paradigm, which I earn my living off of, is uh, experimentally evolving different patterns of aging by changing when populations reproduce. If we force populations to reproduce in early life, they have low longevities. If we force populations to reproduce only later in life, they get greater longevities. And here's the data. Um, this is a mortality plot on a log scale, meaning the higher up on this axis you go, the faster you die. The lower you are, the slower you die. And I'm showing this not primarily for the signal of the differentiation between the A, which are these uh, blue and red type flies, which are reproduced early ages, and age super fast, or the uh, longer lived organisms, which don't even start aging until around age 30 and then age. But I want you to look at the variation between the results in two respects. So this was done using 20 populations. And to collect these data involves starting with about 100,000 flies. And each line that you see is one sex of, one of the two sexes of 10,000 flies each. Having used that level of replication and having used that strong experimental evolution signal differentiation, you can see you get qualitatively distinct results here, right? OK. So it is possible to produce these gigantic differences without having to resort to inbreeding. And furthermore, it is possible to then analyze those differences genomically with actually far greater signals than are characteristically found in most genomic analyses. Perfect. Over here, <clears throat> I want you to notice the Y scale, which is the statistical significance. The 200 means the result of 10 to the minus 200 significance in terms of p-value, 10 to the minus 200. That's an astronomical level of significance. We use very aggressive false discovery rate filtering, which is the red line. You have to get more than 10 to the minus 180 on this analysis, testing more than a million sites in the genome. But we can do it because we did so much replication. Absent that replication, we couldn't do it. So my basic message is here. We need a new biology, especially if we want to understand wild populations that aren't inbred or human populations, because we aren't inbred. And it is possible to construct one. We've been taking baby steps toward that goal. So if you do this new kind of biology with outbred organisms using massive replication, you don't have to endlessly retract your results, and you don't have to explain away why other labs don't get what you got. Thank you. <laughs>